Good morning, friends. Uh, today's question ties in with the, the um, and there's a couple of different questions involved in this one, but it's, it's about how do we know if someone is a deceiver? In essence, a false prophet. With that idea comes this question also. How do we know during spiritual battles in the church, which direction to go. When divisions come, what is the correct way? These are three different questions, much, much the same point. Uh, in essence, if you have a division going on in a church, there's going to be those that are leading that division. So we can begin with that. So. These all tie together quite, quite closely. The the divisions, the uh, the deceiver that is dividing, or the those that are trying to divide. The, these are much the same thing. So we have false prophets. We have we have uh, those that are trying to follow the word. So how do we know? How do we know which is the right way to go? What do we look for? So, to begin with, I'm going to break this apart just a little bit. There's, there's a few different ways we can look at this, and I think by, by starting, it, it wouldn't hurt at all to discuss what is a false prophet. Well, a false prophet is one who is bringing a message that is false. It's not the correct message. So, a prophet is, in essence, a messenger. We, we could go and look at a few different things. I think Deuteronomy 18 talks about that. Uh, if I'm right on that, I could be wrong. But it speaks of, of, of a prophet and, and whether they're a true prophet or a false prophet. The idea being, a prophet, a prophet is nothing more than a messenger bringing the message of his master. And that's a simplified way of saying it. But he's bringing the message of his master. So a true prophet would be one bringing the message of God. A false prophet would be one who is bringing the message of Satan. They each have masters. Everybody has a master. You cannot serve two masters, so you serve the one, love the one, and hate the other. This is biblical. We can find that. I didn't actually look for that text, but we could. Um, love the one and hate the other. But a man cannot serve two masters. Jesus tells us that. But you're going to bring the message of your master. You will have a master, and you are going to bring the message of your master. So it's going to be a message that is in accordance with the word of God, or it's going to be the message that is in accordance with what Satan desires. And it's very simple. Obviously, we get emotionally involved in all of these things, and we start looking at relationships, and, and this is bringing it into the, perhaps, friendships. Um, so we could look somebody who's trying to be decept uh, a deceiver who is also a friend or a family member. I understand that. Th these things can these things play into it. There's emotions there. Or perhaps church. If you've been in a church for a number of years, perhaps the same location all of your life, and, and a division is coming. There, there would be also this, that there's a lot of emotion involved. Perhaps your family is there. Perhaps friends. Uh, if you've been there for many years, there, there would certainly be friends and family. With that in mind, you end up getting emotionally involved and not looking at the correct way. And that is what I want to explain today. What is the correct way? How, what, what is the path forward? Well, it's, it's actually quite simple. There is a path forward. I didn't dig this one up, but it's one Psalm 119. Uh, what I think it is. Let me look. Bear with me a moment. Yes, Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Okay, so we, we, we see with this. Thy word, this is God we're speaking to. 
thy word, O Lord, is a light or a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We can see the way forward in the word. How does Jesus talk about it? Because that's Old Testament. Maybe it's hard to understand. He tells us in John 14, 6. And I'll go there also. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way. This language, this language of, of way isn't normally looked at quite the same in the English language. It's, it's, it's maybe a little bit harder to see, but if we look at, if we study the, the, the root word of it both, a path and a way are the exact same thing. Both of them could be called a road. We can go back to Psalm 119.105. Thy word is a lamp or a light for the road forward. And Jesus says, I am that road. And he's also the lamp because he's the light. And he's the word. You begin to start seeing that Christ is all in all. He's the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. So, he's the way forward. My goal here today is to show you I'm not worried about division. I don't want you following which way. I don't want you looking to this man or that man. And I'm gonna I'm gonna bring you to what I find to be an interesting spot in the scriptures. It's uh, Joshua. I believe it's the fifth chapter. Yes, it is. The fifth chapter of Joshua. This is at a time when the Israelites had just crossed into, crossed the River Jordan into Israel. And uh, they were preparing to conquer the Promised Land. And so we're starting on verse 13 through 15 then. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand, and Joshua went unto him and said, Art thou for us, or for our adversaries? I want to show you here, before I move on to the next verse. The circumstances are that Joshua sees a man standing there, and he's got a sword in his hand. Joshua's response is, Are you for us? For, for us or for them? How did this man respond? It's fascinating. He said no. What did he mean by that? What it means is that Joshua had asked the wrong question. It isn't about, are you for us or for them? And he explains this in the next two verses. Well, the next verse and then the following one ties it together. So in the 14th verse, he says, Nay. I'm going to reread 13 just to get it back into context. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay. But as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place where thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. That was the proper response by that man, which perhaps was an angel. 
uh, he says he's the captain of the host of the Lord. So I'm assuming that means angel. He, he was not for the Israelites, nor was he against the Israelites. He was with the Lord of hosts. And I hope that when you're dealing with fears, divisions, worries, schisms, uh, when you're dealing with any sort of battles in your churches, in your congregations, uh, in your homes concerning faith, concerning the Word of God, that you don't begin to look as to whether or not you are for or against a person or an organization that you don't begin to start thinking it's me against them that it's them against us that it's any of that the goal is always to remember the one that comes Jesus Christ and him crucified I promise to stand with the Lord of hosts. That's the place to be. And when we go there, we have no fears whatsoever. Now, how do we know that? How, how do we know which way this is? Well, it's, it's actually quite simple. We can go to John. I'm, I'm going to go to 1 John, in fact, uh, chapter 4. And we will look at how the scripture tells us to look at these things. So the first three verses, perhaps. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. So we find ourselves looking at these verses. It's, it can get complicated, but it, it shouldn't. We realize that we are to test the spirits. This is, this is our job. Jesus told us to know them by their fruits. Well, there's a reason that the that we would know them by their fruits. It's also based on their spirit. So the spirit that rules the person is what you will see in the fruits. The result of that spirit, perhaps, is a different way of saying it. But the point is, we are. It's our job to test the spirits, to try them, to see if they be of God. I hope we can understand that this is different than judging people. It's not. It's not about judging the person. It's about judging the ruler of that person and the doctrine of that person, the teaching that they follow. This is not about condemning individuals, but rather about condemning their doctrines. So now how do we know? He says, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. That seems like, well, that everybody knows that Jesus came in the flesh. It's bigger than that. This was a very simplistic way of telling us that one who confesses that Jesus Christ came in the flesh recognizes that not only did Jesus come in the flesh, he came and he fulfilled the law perfectly for you and I because we were unable to please God. Because we had failed so utterly and continue to fail so utterly in all that we do that we need a Savior. And Jesus fulfilled all that God required of us on our behalf. Overcoming, well, first off, doing the work, dying on account of it, he took our punishment that which we re was required of us and we deserve. We should have been hung on the cross. We deserve that death. And he did it in place of us and appeased an, a, an almighty God. 
that demanded this sacrifice. And then he rose victorious over it. Sin, death, and the, the devil have been conquered by Jesus Christ. And that's given to us. And I want to go more than just to us, to me. And I hope that you, my listener, are hearing the same thing and saying, yes, Jesus Christ is my Savior. He died for me and rose victorious for me. And I also have peace with God on account of my faith in Jesus Christ. That's what that verse means. But I assure you that verse 3 of chapter 4, uh, 1 John, when he says that every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, that means the exact opposite. That means that that spirit cannot confess that Jesus Christ is my salvation and cannot confess it confidently that my sins are forgiven. And that God sees me as righteous and holy. That's what it means. That I can confidently stand assured before God that I am a child of God, having full confidence in my salvation. That's what that third verse means. And so then here we see those who don't believe that their sins are actually forgiven. They believe they have to do something different. They might call themselves Christians. But they don't actually believe what they say that they believe. And so it's without confidence that they stand before God. Doubting, fearful, worried about their... Hoping, perhaps, that there might be a chance of them being saved. There might be some hope of heaven here, but not sure if they really have it. That's what that third verse means. Now I'm going to bring you to, to, because this can still be a little bit confusing to apply that terminology. So let's go to Galatians chapter 5. And we will look at those last verses. The works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. Starting on verse 19 through the end. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Manifest means clear. They're, everybody can see them. They're evident. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections thereof, affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. You can see very clearly that Paul here in Galatians is telling us how we can test the Spirit. How, when Jesus told us to know them by their fruits, here's how you know them. So when we, now to bring it back to the original questions, the original questions were about, how do you know if there's a false prophet? How do you know if there's, what side of a division you wish to be on? When there's spiritual battles, when there's divisions, what is the correct way? How do you know? Well, Galatians 5 lays it out as clear as can be. When you get to that uh, 20th verse, 
idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. Hatred sticks out pretty, pretty far. Variance, that would be a, divis a, a divisiveness that comes from that. Emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. All of these are speaking much of the same thing. An anger and a spirit of division. Heresies is a little bit different in this, that it's coming in with a different doctrine. Um, I actually prefer one of the one of the um, definitions of heresy that I heard, which states that all of us have errors in us, but one who persists in wrong doctrine is a heretic. So we're all, we, we all have wrong doctrine, errors, we, we, we screw up on everything. We do, nobody has a complete, perfect understanding of the entire Bible. No one. Most of us don't know what our problems are. But we may have the, the main points, justification by faith alone, for example, faith in Christ, by grace alone. These things are really, really important. All glory to God alone. These are really important aspects to remember. And if we understand those properly, that's enough. But when we get into divisions and strife and heresies, now people are bringing in other things and mixing those doctrines together. And when we can begin to see that these doctrines are mixed and mingled in such a way that it's hard to find out. We can, we can struggle with these points. But then we go back and we look. Who's trying to divide things? Who's trying to break this love? Who's upset? It's one thing to come in and say, you know, this has been taught incorrectly. We need to, un we need to get this correct. You, you, can't have, you can't hold that in line with justification by faith alone. They're two different things. They don't fit together. That's not division. That's correction. And it's okay to correct. We are to rebuke, reprove, exhort with all long suffering. This, this is scriptural. It's necessary that we would correct properly. Rebuke and reprove. Absolutely necessary. As a child of God, this is our job that we keep the purity of doctrine in the Christian church. Those that are opposed to correcting their doctrine and begin to focus on other matters are going to cause problems. That's where you see the division. On the flip side now, the fruit of the Spirit of God, that is, the Holy Spirit, is going to be love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All of these things are actually promoting peace and meekness and long-suffering. It promotes them when we try to correct wrong doctrine. So if, you're, if you actually correct the doctrinal mistakes and errors in the church, and I assure you every church has them, if you correct those, it promotes unity and peace. When that's not heard, you have division. So, look for those who are focused on pr promoting correct doctrine in the Word. You yourself, personally, need to promote unity through correct doctrine and personal faith. You need to believe that you personally are saved. You need to be completely assured that Christ is your salvation, not this organization that's trying to divide you. Don't get hung up on that. Christ is the way. I'm not worried about you choosing sides, and in the long run, Joshua was not either. Joshua understood when it was all said and done that it is best to stand with the Lord of hosts. 
that's where we find peace and assurance through Jesus Christ. Never in following man will we find our peace. Never in joining sides will we find peace. True peace is only when we are justified by faith, which is exactly what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. He says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And here we need to stand. Every one of us needs to be completely confident that we are justified by faith, by grace, by the merit works of Jesus Christ. That's where we find peace. Then it doesn't matter if the entire world falls down around us because we're saved. And when we have that assurance, we cannot go wrong. So dear brother or sister worrying about these things, turn to Christ. He's our salvation. Find your confidence in him. And there's your peace. With that, I'm going to let you go. God bless you all. And thanks for the question, by the way.